I want to back up just for a moment and get back to the scoring of that functional index where you look at how it's graded with minimum disability and then moving down to complete disability. Uh, you'll see later that a 10% improvement uh, in this scoring system is considered uh, pretty decent. But you'd be surprised how many people I've worked with that when they graded themselves, graded at a level of minimum disability, yet were still frustrated with where they were and were looking for other options. And this used to happen a lot when I was in my surgical practice and someone would come in for a surgical consultation, want to find out what can be done to get themselves fixed, so to speak, and they graded out at a minimum level of disability and yet were still looking at wanting to at least think about surgery so that they could get back to their everyday life just the way that they wanted to where all was perfect. That can be really dangerous because it is rare that any surgery or for that matter any treatment is going to get you lower than being graded out at minimum disability. And in fact, if you grade out at that level, then you're at the point where a treatment, any treatment, would probably have about as much of a chance of making you worse as it would making you better. So the risk-benefit ratio just isn't there. Now, what I want to do now is let's move forward and uh, talk about pain. Again, I said it's simple and straightforward, 0 to 10, 0 to 100. I am sure that most of you have seen these scales where 0 is no pain, and then it goes to annoying, uncomfortable, horrible, worst, and there are various ways that this can be done. I'm often asked, uh, doctor, look, I have a high pain tolerance, or I'm not asked that, I'm told that. And so how can I grade this because my pain tolerance isn't like other people? Well, you grade it according to the way you interpret your pain. That's all that matters. Not how someone else might interpret their pain, not what their pain uh, sensitivity would be or their pain tolerance. It all has to do with how the pain applies to you. So keep that in mind. This is straightforward and simple. Now I want to talk about the third metric, which is kinesiophobia or the fear index. What is it? We kind of uh, illustrated that earlier, but here's how it's defined clinically. You can read it for yourself. It's the preoccupation that movement is going to do more damage to yourself. That is one of the reasons why through this whole program I talk about the difference between hurt and harm. The inability to move through some level of discomfort and excess fear plays a big role in how well and how quickly you're going to recover or for that matter if you will recover. I'm not saying that it's a no pain no gain situation but far too many individuals are afraid of their pain and that's largely because of the poor information they have been given about it and what it means. And I get into that in a lot of detail in the learning module pain, what it is, what it isn't, and why it's important for you to know. Anyway, that's not for this section. So let's move forward and talk about why we measure kinesiophobia. Those with high levels of kinesiophobia have a higher risk of developing chronic pain and becoming deconditioned. They're not a good fit for aggressive treatments such as surgery. Research study after research study has shown that individuals with a high fear index don't do well with surgery. They often do better with more conservative measures and they may even stand to benefit the most by what's called cognitive behavioral therapy or helping to get more in line with a better understanding of what pain is to desensitize themselves and to handle it in a more constructive way. Higher scores are also associated with lower 
pain thresholds and an increasing chance of depression. So when you're afraid to move, when you focus on every single ache or pain you experience, that is likely going to cause your pain threshold to lower, which becomes somewhat of a self-perpetuating cycle. There are numerous research papers that have been written about this. Here's an example of one that was relatively recent from 2018, and you can see what it says. If you would like more information on this, I have an entire file, and I'd be happy to send it to you if you just drop me an email, rdf.fud.10 at gmail.com. Now, here's the kinesiophobia index, and it's called the Tampa Kinesiophobia Scale. And you can see for yourself how it's laid out. There are 17 different questions, and each question you check the box that applies to you on a number one through number four basis, where one is strongly agree with that statement, and two is disagree, and then four is strongly agree. I'm sorry, one is strongly disagree and four is strongly agree. Uh, my bad there, uh, I didn't read that properly. But anyway, let's, let's move on and see how it's graded. This is a little more complicated than the Oswestry index that we talked about before, but be aware that scoring is an important area where I will work with you individually to make sure that you have a good, clear idea of how to use these scales. So this is something that I do in the uh, individual one-on-one -on -one training or coaching module, or at least one of them, and there are four of them, and we spend a lot of time on this to make sure that you're grading yourself properly and that you can use this on your own as you progress through either my program or any other treatment that you may be receiving. So let's look at how this is graded. So you add up the total that you assign for all of the numbered questions, except for numbers 4, 8, 12, and 16, and you enter that total on the line. Now, for these 4, 8, 12, and 16, you add up your total, but the total is inverted, and you can see how to do that. So if you entered 4, strongly agree, you would invert that number and score it a 1, and you put that total on the next line. And then you add up those totals, and that determines what your kinesiophobia index is. Here's how it's graded, and you can see subclinical to normal at less than 22, and severe fear of movement at greater than 42. So here's an example of it, and I'm not going to go through it check mark by check mark, but you can see how I have endorsed this form at those various questions. And here's how it would grade up. If I add up my total for everything except 4, 8, 12, and 16, I would grade out at 35. I'm going to go slowly here so that you can take a look at it. Uh, maybe do it on your own. And if you want me to send you copies of this index or the Oswestry index we talked about earlier, uh, you can also send me an email and ask for that. I'll be happy to do it. So 35 is graded out for those uh, numbers except for 4, 8, 12, and 16. And then for the 4, 8, 12, and 16, with inverted scales, I grade out a 12, which would put me in this example at a 47, which is severe fear of movement. If I'm in this category as a patient, or you're in this category as a client that I'm working with, then a lot of care needs to be taken to move through this movement training very slowly so that you gain the confidence that the movements you're doing and the pain you may experience with those movements is not causing you harm. And that is one of the coolest things about the Spine Camp program is that no movement that is used is putting your position in a body where it will further damage body tissue. So even if you're feeling discomfort, you can be confident that as you move through that, you're not doing further harm to your body, and that alone will help to improve your kinesiophobia index 
and give you a better chance of recovering and doing well on a long-term basis. So now we're going to get into what success means. <laughs> you can see how do you spell success. It means different things to different people. And that cliche has been said a long time ago that success is in the eye of the beholder. I'm going to give you a few examples of how science and research define success.